Hi, I'm DJ Ware. On this episode of the Cyber Gizmo on uh, Christmas Eve in 2019, I'm going to be looking at a uh, update uh, for Risk Five based on the summit that was held a couple of weeks ago in San Jose. Right after this. Yeah, so one of the problems, one of the problems I had in not attending is that uh, yeah, it's a little hard. You have to wait until it catches up to find out what's going to happen and what's going on. So I'm going to try to take some of the large announcements. Now there is a lot more. There was like 25, and we'll talk about you know some of the things that occurred there. But let, you know, first of all, the summit was held uh, December the 10th. Uh, so that's almost been well, yeah, it's been two weeks ago. So, um, and that was held in San Jose, California. There was uh, 1,670 people registered. I, I don't know that that's the exact spec. That's the one that was presented on the site. Uh, so that's about 500 more than last year. So it's grown at a pretty good clip. About 40 companies had uh, booths at the event, and uh, there were 24 people that presented, and over 25 announcements, maybe 25 uh, uh, plus announcements that were made by companies supporting the Risk Five Foundation. Uh, so, uh, some of the things that are, are to take away here is first, it is growing. The last time I just did did this video, there was about 325 companies that were in the Risk Five Foundation. That has grown pretty significantly. There's now over 440. I think uh, I think on a call last week they said something like. 2,000 individuals are also members of the foundation. So there is definitely a lot of interest uh, in, uh, in this technology. And this, uh, so uh, the ones I'm going to cover today are the announcements from Sci-5, Western Digital, Wind River, Samsung. And then I'll probably bundle a bunch of them at the end and kind of give you some highlights on those. Uh, because I just didn't feel like it was all that, you know, significant of what they were doing to what I had already had talked about. So the other one is microchip. We'll talk about that one. They're, they're really, they have a kind of a teaser about Polar Fire, which is coming next year. Uh, and then, yeah, like I said, it is definitely growing and it is definitely, well, is it? Is it really a, a, uh, an alternative to ARM? I think after this presentation, that question will be answered, I, I think. Uh, at least in my mind it was, and hopefully maybe in yours as well. So let's take a look at Sci-Fi first. Now, their announcement for the U8 series came out in October, and, uh, and this is a, a 7 nanometer fabrication, which is pretty significant because the last chip, the U7, I think was 16 nanometer. Uh, don't quote me on that, but I think it was around 16 nanometers. So yeah, they are definitely advancing pretty quickly. This chip is des the U8 series is designed to compete with the ARM Cortex A72, which of course is ARM's current flagship. Uh, so yeah, they are getting serious, and uh, of course the A72 is the one that competes with Intel at the uh, lower end of the i7 class machines, not certainly not the, not the, uh, it'd be like the 8700, the core i7 8700. Uh, at, at this juncture now, maybe, maybe within the next year, they'll be bypassing them. Uh, I don't know, we'll see. So it, uh, it is an out of order superscalar processor, which puts it in the same league as a Xeon. So yeah, pretty significant. Um, uh, it is, there's also two other things that were announced uh, at two other processors, the Apex, which is for mission critical processors. Uh, and then the, probably the one that would be at least of more interest to me, which would be the intelligence one, which has uh, support for deep learning and it also has the vector extensions supported. So this would really allow audio and speech and probably video and vision and all those kinds of things uh applications for ai so yeah that's that's a pretty significant bump i'm sure it will do general computing just fine too uh western digital is looking to move the memory closer to the compute platform and this is also very significant uh they have their swe rv cores i think they i don't remember how he pronounced it but sweevy 
uh, core, which is a, they have two, well, I think there's actually three models of this, but I'm only going to talk about two. So there's a dual threaded one called the EH2, which is the higher end uh, uh, processor. This is designed, uh, this is designed as a replacement for a storage controller. So uh, these two machines, one is a high performance one and one is a lower one. So I guess you could kind of look at this as in the higher performance one is taking the uh, taking the cache or the memory cache and being able to share that over you know over a network or over uh, with other systems in the in the environment at very high speeds. So not to mention that storage devices could also be pushing data into the processor at high speed. So it's really trying to move. If you, I, I think, um, yeah, I, I'm trying to remember if, uh, I remember seeing a chart once about some of the latency values between hard drives, SSDs, NVMe. So you have, you know, this processor is over on, the, on this side. And as you, as you try to reduce the latency, you're moving the memory closer and closer to the actual processor and, and therefore you're uh, increasing performance. And this kind of a chip is doing exactly that. It's moving that boundary or the amount of latency uh, closer and closer to the processor. So you're really getting in pretty close to L3, not L3, but L2 cache speeds. So hopefully that is where they're intended to go because that's really what needs to be done, in my humble opinion. The memory has always been the bottleneck in uh, processing and uh, has has been since I think about the late 80s, memory really started to become, it started falling way behind, and it is still way behind uh, the ability to process. So uh, one of the things that is also in here is the L EL2 chip, which is a lower power variant of uh, the EH2. Uh, that's really meant to replace sequential logic and state machines. So. I would suspect that would be in lower power devices that, that don't consume as much power. They're not as fast as the uh, EH2, obviously. Uh, this, the uh, second core announcement is the Chips Alliance, which is, is offering support inside of Linux for this WD Risk v uh, Omni Extend, and that is a memory-centric architecture. So again, we're coming back to talking about moving the uh, storage uh, in closer and closer to memory, and this is one of the mechanisms in Linux on how they're going to do that. Uh, it is an open approach, and it is uh, providing cache co coherent memory uh, over the Ethernet, over Ethernet. So that's the first time that I, I mean, I know of some proprietary solutions that do that, uh, but this is the first time an open system that I am aware of has been offered in the uh, Omni Extend. Yes, you can do this with MPI. Yes, it's very complicated to do that in MPI. And it isn't really, it is not really offering an advantage of performance. It's merely enabling the functionality. So MPI is not as quick as this should be. Uh, so anyway, allows memory sharing across the network with every kind of device. So whether it's an FPGA or whether it's a CPU or a RISC CPU. Now what I, they mean by CPU is like ARM or some of the other technologies that are non-RISC-5. Uh, also, GPU memory would be uh, available and uh, other accelerators, their, their core would be available across the network. That means that, I mean, that has implications for not only, uh, not only AI or machine learning, but big data and also high performance computing, but it also has, it has a lot to do with some of the Baywolf clusters, I think and perhaps even some of the storage clusters like uh, Ceph or Gluster or some of those could possibly benefit from that. Right now, those systems have to copy data off of the drives in order to share it with the processors, and that's pretty slow. So potentially, that's pretty significant, at least I think. At least I think, in, in my humble opinion. Uh, microchip technology uh, teased their Polar Fire uh, system on a chip, or SOC. Uh, that is the first hard and real-time uh, Linux-capable RISC-V-based microprocessor subsystem. It is a mid-range FPGA, mid-range meaning, meaning in performance, uh, but it offers <clears throat> defense-grade security in an embedded system. So 
you have a chip that uses 50% less power than the current uh, systems that do this. And it offers uh, L2 uh, memory coherence. So we're back to the Western Digital implementation, possibly, or maybe they're in doing something uh, on their own. But they're also offering that to enable real-time Linux applications. So that's expected to be sampled sometime in third quarter of 2020. I don't know. I'll keep an eye on this and and, uh, and see maybe uh, down the road do some more. It's kind of sketchy at this point on the details and actually what the solution set is intended to do. Uh, Real-time applications would be, like I had said before, would be in medical applications or robotics or, or industrial control systems, something like that. Uh, for most of us, unless we're makers, we're probably not going to be all that interested in real-time uh, in real-time operating systems. But uh, one of the uh, companies that is into real-time operating systems is Wind River, and they offer a commercial package called VXWorks, and they will be implementing that uh, on the microchip and also on Sci Fives uh, Core IP Unleashed. Unleashed is of course the U7 and U8 family. So, yeah, that supports C++ and Boost and Rust and Python and all those kinds of things in a real-time environment where uh, timing is absolutely critical um, in order to continue processing. Probably not for us Linux guys out here, not about really of interest to us, but, uh, you know, if you are working in those spaces, yeah, maybe that would be of interest to you. <clears throat> I mean, there are about two billion uh, devices that use Wind River. It is, it is, uh, yeah, it's pretty popular uh, for uh, our toss. So, um, Samsung they announced that Risk Five will use the Sci Five cores for an upcoming chip design, both for and they're in the mobile market and they're designed to support five G, but they're being implemented on both sides, both the uh, carrier side or the uh, tower. Uh, and that probably some controllers in between, as well as the phone itself. So, uh, so you'll have the 5G front-end modules and the flagship 5G phones uh, in sometime in 2020. And Samsung has already said that these, um, that Risk Five will be part of that architecture. Now, I'm not sure if that means that this is going to be some kind of hybrid, or whether you know the cellular phone is a chip that's using Risk Five in addition to the ARM processors, because I just I can't imagine that Samsung would be trying to convert away from ARM. That would be pretty expensive. And Android, I don't think, I don't know what Android's plans are for RISC-5. I know Google is very interested in RISC-5. They are one of the founding members of RISC-5. So I don't know. Time will tell. <laughs> we'll come back to the story as it unfolds. Uh, so this would obviously have implications for AI image sensors your face sensor, your biometrics, uh, the security management of the phone, being able to encrypt and decrypt data on the system, as well as AI computing and control, which would be of interest to those things that are maybe self-driving cars or something like that. Uh, also, I could see this in the edge parts of the network, uh, and I'm sure that Samsung has plans to do that too. Uh, edge is rapidly growing, and again, I, you know my comments about Edge. I'm not gonna go there again. <laughs> <laughs> some uh, some other things that are occurring. NVIDIA has announced that they will be using uh, the RISC-V as their GPU memory controller. Uh, how much further they will go with that, I don't know. It depends probably on the development as we proceed. Now, RISC-V does have a vector spec. Who knows? Maybe NVIDIA is looking at that as well. It all comes down to performance and uh, and, and and also the fabrication. So... I don't know, but uh, at least for now, GPU memory controllers is where they intend to use this. Qualcomm is set to use RISC-V in a similar manner to Samsung, although I don't know to what degree yet. I guess we'll wait and see. Um, RISC-V obviously offers some financial advantages over ARM. They don't have to license things. They don't have to pay for a, an, an annual license now. I'm sure that RISC-V, in order to support itself in the foundation, will probably come up with some kind of membership fees for these uh, guys, and they already have some of those in place. I don't know how they will tier that out, but we'll see. Uh, the RISC-V offers, obviously, uh, some other advantages and allows companies to create their own custom instruction sets 
uh, for their processors, which allows them not only to differentiate themselves, but also offer solutions in, in markets that the RISC V Foundation hasn't yet incorporated into the instruction design. So that offers some, some, uh, some very unique things that I have never seen in this industry before, except for back in the days when we had processors which would take microcode and reconfigure themselves on the fly, depending upon which language was being executed at the time. So I, I haven't seen anything like that in about 30 years. So interesting. This is, an, this is kind of interesting that uh, this is happening. Um, and just to recap again, <laughs> my old slide from uh, the 1st of, uh, of uh, January of last year. Hopefully I'll get a new one uh, sometime. And, but there are 440 members now. And uh, that's about uh, 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 that's about all I have to talk about, other than just a recap. And so let me do that. So uh, the reason why this interests me so much is because uh, I use ARM in my in, <laughs> they're behind me there in my storage cluster, and so I would like to to consolidate that as much as I can. It looks like the Sci-Fi View Eight, if it trickles down to us poor Linux guys. Um, to maybe allow us to do that, maybe allow us to consolidate some of the ARM uh, systems. I mean, these machines back here are vintage. They're based on the uh, Samsung uh, um, 5 <laughs> processor. So, yeah, that's been a while ago. What are they, 11 now, 12? <laughs> so, yeah, that's been a while ago. So it'd be kind of nice to, uh, to uh, be able to consolidate. Also, virtualization was shown. And I and serve the home um, had a kind of a brief recap video that was on YouTube. I'll put a link to it in below. Uh, he talked about uh, some of the virtualization technologies that he saw running on RISC Five were interesting, but he said he thought it was a little early in the development cycle, meaning probably they had some bugs, and that's probably to be expected as that technology rolls out. So virtualization is probably a way out. Containerization is probably somewhere along that line. Don't know, uh, but. Again, uh, uh, I think I think uh, Risk Five is definitely maturing. I mean, considering <laughs> considering how long how, how short a time it's been, and where they are right now, that's pretty incredible. I mean, I have never seen this kind of innovation and development occurring at this kind of a clip. This is pretty amazing. Um, so, I hope that you enjoyed this video today. If you did, please like and subscribe. And as always, hope to see you again real soon. And bye for now.